I am Felicia. I'm Ian. And we are the Paranormal Lovers. Hey guys. Hey guys. Welcome back to another week of uh, the Paranormal Lovers. Um, We're back with you today for episode six. How you doing? How you doing? Um, This week, I told you guys last week that we would be doing something a little different today. We were going to do, we're going to touch on reincarnation and past life memories. Ow. What do you know about reincarnation, Bill? I know that cats have nine lives. Yeah, they do. Little fuckers. <laughs> so that, I wonder well, if each one of them is different. Oh, that would be something, ain't it? Like they, they like remember it, but they're like a different cat. That would be interesting. It would kind of explain how, like, at first off, you get like a real shy cat. And then, like, he dramatically turns into, like, a psycho kitty. Yeah, I've had that before. <laughs> if you remember Stokes, he was... Yep. He, he kind of switched personalities on me a few times. Um, so, well, we have no scientific way to measure a soul, um, or the age of a soul, or the age of your spirit. But the belief of reincarnation is one that has lasted for millennia. All across different faiths, cultures, and even time itself, the belief that death is simply the beginning of a new life has persisted. Britannica Online states, I went too far, reincarnation, also called transmigration, or having operator difficulties, or metamphysics metempsychosis in religion and philosophy rebirth of the aspect of an individual that persists after bodily death whether it be the conscious the mind the soul or some other entity in one or more successive existences existence depending upon the tradition these existences may be human animal spiritual or in some instances vegetables trees I come back as a broccoli in the next life. I want to be a tree. That would be fun. While most people probably think of an Asian religion when they think of reincarnation, it is a widely held belief of many spiritual practices. Um, you've learned a little bit of this with me. Um, some African religion or spiritual practices sure. believe that when we are sent, we are sent here on a mission to learn about this generation life in this generation when we die our spirit goes to join the rest of the ancestors to be debriefed and all that we learned is put into a generational memory and is stored there for each next generation um and then the spirit hangs out with the other ancestors until they're reborn Buddhism teaches that while there is no soul or self, the energy that we all carry is released and remolded to something or someone else when we die. So that one isn't a, like, your specific soul. It's just the energy that was in your flesh. It's all just energy, and so it'll just go somewhere else when you die. Right. Um, Hinduism believes that our soul is part of a supreme soul and so when our body dies our soul and just enter into a new body buddha 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 i like buddhism it's um i don't agree with all the tenets but it's an interesting religion um but what you are reincarnated as depends on your karma right um from your previous life so, of course, good karma, you know, think you'll, like, be born into some billionaires or something. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's good karma. <laughs> well, <laughs> More money, more problems. Right. Um, bad karma, you might be reincarnated as a weed on the side of the road. Right on. Um, or, I don't know, 
something you could think of that wouldn't be very nice to be. Um, <laughs> a tapeworm. <laughs> yeesh. <laughs> yeesh. Uh, everything good or bad it, that happens in your current life is believed to be tied to the results of who you were in your past life. I don't <laughs> I always thought that yeah. I was John Lennon at some point. I could see that. Um, and the, although it isn't as widely thought of um, in the pagan spirituality practices, a lot of ancestral practices that pagans are going back to um, also tie in in one form of reincarnation or another. And I won't say that it's common, but it is not rare to have reports of children who claim to remember a past life. Right. We have not ran into that. Thank God. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do if my kid comes to me and says half the crap these kids are saying. As long as she don't say, hey, hell Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> just wait. <clears throat> um Roughly 70% of these accounts include memories of a sudden, violent, or traumatic death. Writer Jim Tucker and late Ian Stevenson spent years interviewing children who claimed to have past life memories. Hmm. The children who were willing participants in these interviews would give such detailed accounts that they would easily be able to go and track down who they were claiming to be, or track down information on who they were claiming to be because obviously the person's already dead right but they would easily be able to be like well these sound real familiar so let's look for the parameters in this area and then um in tucker's book return to life extraordinary cases of children who remember past lives there are several accounts of these experiences um one of the there here's a couple of these accounts one states quote when Ryan was four, he began directing imaginary movies. Shouts of action often echoed from his room, but the play became a concern for Ryan's parents when he began waking up in the middle of the night screaming and clutching his, ses- his chest, saying he dreamed his heart exploded while he was in Hollywood. Hmm. And keep in mind, Ryan is four. <laughs> his mother asked his doctor about the episodes. Night terrors, the doctor said. He'll grow out of them. Then one night, as his mother tucked Ryan into bed, Ryan suddenly took hold of her hand. Mama, he said, I think I used to be someone else. Hmm. He said he remembered a big white house and a swimming pool. It was in Hollywood, many miles from his Oklahoma home. He said he had three sons, but he couldn't remember their names. He began to cry and ask his mother over and over again why he couldn't remember their names. Hmm. The story, and that, let's see, that's the end of the quote, but the story goes on to talk about how after several nights of this, Ryan's mother was concerned, so she started doing research on her own. She found old photo books from, like, old Hollywood movies, and she would flip through them, and while she was looking through one of them, Ryan spots the man and he says that's me mama and she was like okay so after a little more research and after getting in contact with jim tucker they were actually able to locate the daughter of the man that ryan believed he was and with her she was able to verify many of the things that he claimed hmm that to remember because they did live in a big white house and they had a pool and they were in Hollywood. Um, sure. And he ended up being a, he was just like an extra, but he was like a regular extra in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so they were able to find him and his daughter. And that's wild. That is wild. Um, this one's also a little wild. Another account from the book talks of a child who has memories of the Titanic. Hmm. Her story, a little bit of her story is, quote, When I was 12, I woke up having a distinct feeling of a rocking ship. I was in my bed, but it felt as if I was on a rocking ship. I also got very claustrophobic, as if I was in a small room. 
that same afternoon when I got home from school, I watched a history program on the Titanic. It was really odd. I was watching it alone, and I was seeing footage with people I'd never seen before, but I would remember their names. Hmm. The narrator would tell the names a while after, and I was right. End quote. Wow. Yeah. Um, Her story goes on to continue to say that when she was in school, she went to a Titanic exhibit. And as she came across a ring, she sees a ring in a case and she recognizes it as hers. Hmm. And when she does, that rocking sensation and the claustrophobia comes back. Weird. Yeah. And she was able to read the plaque and it... um, She was able to read the plaque, and even though there was no name on it, she was able to learn that it came from a woman who was engaged, and she ended up drowning on the Titanic. Hmm. So, that's quite, quite interesting. Um, And so, another story, and here's kind of the big, the big chunk of this story today. Um, You know, I've been getting caught up on, and that's why we drink. Sure. Um, great podcast. It is a great podcast. Um, M. M. Schultz has probably, she has, they have, they, excuse me, they have a lot of the stories that um, I'll probably use for some recommendation or reference. And I got this story sure. from M. So thank you, M. Thanks. Um, so one of the most interesting accounts of past life memories and possible reincarnation is the story of Barbaro Carlin. Barbaro? Barbaro. It's not Barbara. Or, well, it's like Barbara. Barbaro. Barbaro. It reminds me of the dog from Skyrim. Barbaros. Yeah, it's close. Just kind of without an S, maybe. Right. So... Nine years before Barbara was born in Sweden, the Holocaust was raging across Germany. And, trigger warning, this story will have a lot of talk of Holocaust, Nazis, um, and some other very uncomfortable mentions of um, suicide and possible self-harm. Don't forget to punch a Nazi. We do not condone violence, but if you have the (laughs) urge to punch a Nazi, we're not going to shame you for it, okay? (laughs) Do what you want. Um, Okay, I do condone violence against Nazis a lot. I I think a bunch of them is fine. (laughs) So, nine years before Barbara was born in Sweden, the Holocaust was raging across Germany. 15-year-old Anne Frank was murdered at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Anne's father, Otto, was the only relative who survived the concentration camps. In 1947, the Diary of Anne Frank was published in Dutch by Otto with the help of and support of Anne's main cousin, who was still alive. When Barbara was born in 1954, the story of Anne Frank had not quite reached her family in Sweden yet. Right. Which kind of boggles my mind to think that there was a time that no one knew who Anne Frank was. Right. Um... Kind of wish we were still living in a time where no one knew who Anne Frank was, but, you know. I just watched a movie that was set in that time. It was, like, 1920s. Interesting. It's a good movie. It was about Nazis, too. Mm. But Was it Inglorious Bastards? No. Uh, crap, what was the name of it? Uh, Amsterdam. I think I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet. It was about a conspiracy where, like, um, a American general was they they had like proposed him to like support these big companies that were making uh, Nazi propaganda and stuff. Interesting. And how he uh, went on like national television to give a speech that was telling people, "Hey, this is happening. Like, we need to do something about it." <laughs> wow. Yeah. But. Well. When Barbara started telling her family that her name was Anne and that they weren't her real family and talking about people that they had no idea who they were. Right. 
she also started having vivid dreams and nightmares about being in a concentration camp. Her very Christian parents chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Sure. Yeah. As she got older, she became more and more insistent that she was Anne Frank, not Barbara, and her questions just kept on coming. And even though her parents still believed she would just grow out of it, they did take her to be seen by a psychiatrist who could find nothing to diagnose. Right. And it wasn't until she was in school in the 60s that Barbara finally learned who Anne Frank was. But here's, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's kind of funny. Like, when they started talking about Anne Frank in school, she wasn't like, oh, shit. Like, this I, this, I, this feels familiar. No, she went, why do they know about my life? Hmm. I've never told any of them about my life. How did they know this? Right. Um, so, it was a shock to her. Sure. After taking it upon herself to learn more about Anne Frank, she found that they had several similarities between them. Likes and dislikes. Some things they both enjoyed include being outside, working with animals, reading and writing. But they also shared some of the same fears, including fear of men in uniform, getting their hair cut, and taking showers. Right. During her teenage years, Barbara became a well-known published author. Her first book of poetry was published at 12. Nice. And had she had written, I want to say, like eight books by the time, and published eight books by the time she turned 18. Wish I could have been that creative. Well, me and you both. One year... Barbara and her family decide to take a vacation to Amsterdam. Um, I don't know if you know anything about Amsterdam, but it would seem that their streets are laid out in a not, um, not in a really pattern. They're not perpendicular. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a grid. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. It's not even really a circle. It's just kind of, they kind of go. It's like Boston. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow, Boston streets are weird. Um, so her dad stops to ask for directions and she goes, no, 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 no need. I can get us there. Right. This child has never stepped foot in Amsterdam in her life. Right. And again, tourists have a hard time. It's best if you have a guide. Or have somebody that can just take you around in taxis. But sure. No, no. Barbara didn't need that. She was like, we're going to go down this alley over here. And then we're going to take this back street over here. And then we're going to cut through this park over here. And within minutes, they popped out in front of Anne Frank's house. Hmm. Like, you can't tell me she ha she wasn't there before. In right. In some life. <laughs> sure. Um, And I'll follow... The facade of the building had changed on the outside. She was able to kind of guide her family through the house, room mm. by room, like their own Tell personal them about tour it. guide. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, like, this is the ballroom, and we had this party in here for this. Yeah. This was my room. I hung these posters on the wall. Well, when they get to that room that was Anne's room, she said she remembers vividly hanging those posters on her wall as Anne. Hmm. But when they get there, they're not there. Right. So at this point, you know, having her parents being like, you'll grow out of it. It's just a phase. Like, this isn't real. And then she goes, okay, I know for a fact that this was there. Why are they not there? She kind of starts questioning herself a little bit, maybe. Right. Um, so her mother was like, hang on. Let me go check. So she goes and finds a guide and she talks to, she asks them, like, were there pictures hanging on this wall? And they were like, yeah, yeah, those were Anne's posters. And we just took them down to frame them because people keep touching them and they're falling apart and we want to preserve them. And we're going to stick them right back. Right. So from that point, her mom was like, I believe. 
Yeah. She's like, you were Anne Frank reincarnated. I believe this. Sure. Her dad, he would not admit that reincarnation was possible. You know, some of those real staunch Christian people that Jesus is the only one that can come back to life. Yeah. I mean, religion shouldn't be followed so strictly that it compresses your thoughts. Yeah. Keeps you very narrow minded and limited on your belief system and what you can learn or believe. At least that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody thinks like that, but um he wouldn't admit that it was possible, but he was like, you know, kid, there is something different about you. Right. I he don't knew. know what it is, but he there's knew. something. He knew. He knew. He just did not want to admit he it. He didn't want to believe it. Mm-mm. No, because after you've been told that that's the only true religion and that nothing else is real. It would go against his religion. It would go so hard against everything he ever knows. And most people don't like that. They don't want to have to look at themselves in the mirror. In adulthood, after having a child herself, Barbara decided to get a secure job that could pay her bills. Obviously, she was an author, but she wanted to have a secure, dependable paycheck to pay her bills. Right. So you want to know what she did? What'd she do? Well, she loved horses, and she wanted to confront one of those fears head on. So she became a mounted police officer. Nice. Like, good for her. Sure. Um, she loved her job. She was really, really good at her job. She was able to work through and heal some of that fear that she had from her past life. I have mad respect for horse-mounted officers. Honestly, if I was to ever be a cop, which I will never be a cop, that would be what kind of cop I would want to be. I mean, there are some cool cops that are... They're so cool. I mean, they they're just, they just want to ride their horses. They do. That's <laughs> it. Like, if I'm going to be a cop, give me a horse, because I want to ride the horse. Um, and the hell about getting away from a guy like that? Yeah, I mean, there's nowhere to go. He, he'll follow you anywhere. Like, he'll follow you That anywhere. horse is going... It's gone. Yeah, and you better stop, because if that horse comes down on you, that's going to hurt. You know? Or getting headbutted by a horse, or getting I mean, kicked by a horse. Maybe maybe a street bike or something will get away from him, but... That would probably be about it. That's about it. Yeah. On foot, you've had it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she did love her job, but... At some point during her 15 years on the force, there were two co-workers that gave her a lot of problems. Right. Um, And didn't go super deep onto it. They did say that if you could, if you really wanted to look into it, there's probably an interview or something somewhere where Barbara goes really in-depth into what she experienced working with these two men on the force. Yeah. Um, There's not a lot. Other than, like, maybe one or two interviews on it. And it's not really... That part is not my story to tell. Right. It's Barbara, so I'll let her tell it. Um, Yeah. But it was bad. It was really, really bad. And her mental health took a very dark turn and went down a very, very deep path that had her dealing with suicidal ideations. Right. Um, one night while dealing with all this, she had a dream and she wasn't having up until these two people came to her job. She wasn't having nightmares or vivid dreams about this stuff. But once the stuff started happening at work, the nightmares popped back up one night. She claims to have a dream in that dream. It was much like the others, but she actually learned that the two officers she was dealing with in this life were reincarnations of two Nazis that Anne had to deal with at the concentration camp. Huh. Yep. Which, you know what? Barbara is a strong woman because I don't know how I would be able to accept that. Be like, oh, that's great. Yeah, it's a tough one to deal with. Like, ooh. Um... But Barbaro said, you know what? They killed me in my last life. They're not going to kill me in this life. Sure. So, you know, she was able to, she left her job. She was able to get help, 
you know, she was able to work through that and move past it. So good for her. Yeah, good for her. Especially, you know, they took her out one time. They weren't going to do it again. Let's see. In 2000, Barbara published her book. Sorry, I did 2000. That was 23 years ago. Yeah. Bananas. <laughs> We're old, baby. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I feel well, it. Sorry. Middle-aged. <laughs> We're getting there. So in 2000, Par- Barbara published her book, And the Wolves Howled, Fragments of Two Lifetimes, which is her first public claim to being the reincarnation of Anne Frank. Of course, there are skeptics abound, um, but that doesn't stop her from holding speaking engagements about her experience and her memories and whatnot. One night, Barbaro had her publisher had requested that she meet a fan for dinner. That's all she knew about this guy. Is he was a fan. He wanted to meet her. What she didn't know was that it was in fact Anne's Anne Frank's cousin Buddy Ellis or Elias. I want to say Elias. Hmm. Um, of course, Buddy was also like, this chick's claiming to be my cousin who died in a concentration camp. Right. You say what now? Um, so he actually, he was friends with her publisher and her publisher told him about her. So he was like, set up this meeting. I want to pretend that I'm just a fan and I want to get to know her. Right. Just see what she's after. See what her angle is. See if she's telling the truth. Yeah, because not only was he, you know, Anne's cousin and he has or had memories of growing up playing with Anne when they were children, but he was also the leader of the Anne Frank Foundation. Right. Which is a huge organization with lots of money. Yeah. Um, that being said, he was skeptical, but... It is said that when Barbara walked in the restaurant and they saw each other, they felt a deep soul connection. Right. And they instantly just hugged each other and just cried and cried and cried and cried. Yeah. There was no need for words, nothing. There were, he was like, that's, that's my cousin. Like, he knew it was her. Yeah. His soul knew her soul. And he was like, that's it. Sure. That being said, when they met, I believe Buddy was in his, like, 70s. Hmm. And Barbara was maybe in her, like, late 20s, early 30s or something like that. Right. So, people were like, I don't know about that. This yeah. chick's trying to fool over this old man so she can get her hands on that Anne Frank Foundation. Right. So, eventually, because Buddy was so public with his support for Barbara. She had to get him to stop publicly supporting her right. so that he could keep his position so that he wouldn't be, you know, blackballed or whatever. Sure. And although he did stop, he still went to his grave in 2005 believing that his cousin had been reborn and he got another chance to have her in his life. That's cool. Yeah. That's pretty dope. And they yeah. did. They spent a lot of time together and they could... They could, like, remember things. Like, they would talk about stuff that happened together and stuff, which I can't imagine that. Like, you think your cousin's gone, and then 30-something years down the line, like, nope, I'm back. Right. So, today, Barbaro is still a writer, as well as an equestrian, and she lives a peaceful life. I don't know where. I didn't let, let, her, let her live. Right. Um... Some of her memories have faded, but she does still have several from her time as Anne. And she believes that her life calling is to do justice to Anne's story, to keep giving the life, to keep living the life Anne never got to have, and to continue spreading light to the world, as Anne Frank wanted. Sure. Before shit hit the fan. It's beautiful. It was beautiful, and that's a great story. And so that is our story on past lives and reincarnation. What do you think about Barbara, Bill? It's kind of cool that she got a second life. I mean, yeah. not not many people get that, but 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure Anne Frank deserved it, you know. She really did. I mean, she was only 15 when she died. Yeah. And, like, it was said that there was a part where she actually started, like, forgetting some memories after she turned 15. Yeah. Because people think, like, <clears throat> that's as far as Anne got. Right. Um, but then when she started that job with the cops and those cops started messing with her, her memories started coming back. Right. Um, I just yeah. think it's a, a beautiful thing to like imagine that people that are taken too soon get, you know, another chance. Yeah, for sure. And like she got to, she, she gets to grow old yeah. this time. You right. Know? Um, can't remember at one point, I think Barbara was 70, 71, something like that. And it was her birthday, and she was like, you know, if I hadn't have been murdered, I'd have been 80. Right. Like, it wasn't that, it's interesting, it wasn't that far removed yeah. from the time of Anne's death to when Barbara was born. Sure. It's almost like Anne was like, no, 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 no. I'm not done. Right. But and I think that's... Like, a lot of religions, other than Christianity, will, like, kind of corroborate that. Like, if, if they're taken too soon, they go back and get another chance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse the frog in my throat. <laughs> yeah. Um, even Christianity, I think, some people and their Christian beliefs believe that, like, especially if it's, like, a really small child or a baby or something that passes that their soul gets to re go again. Cause they didn't really ever get a chance. Sure. Um, but yeah, so that's that you guys let us know what you think. Um, follow us on Instagram at the paranormal lovers. You can send us an email for a, Topic request or a personal story or something of that sort at the paranormal lovers at yahoo.com. And let's see, what let us know what see? you think. Yeah, for sure. Let us know what you think. Next week, we'll have an alien for you. Yes, yay, alien time! Do 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 do. And it's uh, it's a doozy, it's a doozy. Cool. All right, we will see you guys next week. Bye, guys.